Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hello, my name's Cray, and on behalf of the Australian Water School, welcome to today's webinar covering the hydrological and environmental impacts of fires. Uh, we're excited to introduce to you our presenters today. But first of all, let's uh, welcome all of you from around the world, whether you call them forest fires, wildfires, or bushfires, whether you say catchments or watersheds, uh, wherever you are in the world, we hope we can provide you some content today that will help to advance the science, maybe highlight some of the available data that's out there and help us better prepare for the future impacts that do seem more likely to keep increasing uh, in light of climate change, as we'll hear today. I moved to Australia with my family just a few months after the Black Saturday bushfires in 2009. I was really alarmed at the extent of the devastation as we drove around looking for a place to live in Melbourne. Now, as a hydraulic engineer, my focus has mainly been on the catchment impacts. How do you account for the change in rainfall runoff response? But that's obviously just one piece of the puzzle. Having a look at our poll results, it looks like we've got quite a distribution of interests the professional roles that everyone takes uh, around the world here, um, those attending um, are really distributed between uh, water quality and environmental impacts, um, the volume, um, like the hydrology. We're, we've really got a wide range of uh, interests here. And for our presenters today, if you can uh, turn on your cameras and say good day, I'd be interested to uh, let us know what you do and which aspects of bushfires you're focused on. And then we'll hear more detail about those interests and that background as part of our panel discussion and during your own presentations. So welcome to our expert presenters today. Maybe uh, if we could start with uh, Jacqueline and then Patrick and then Rebecca, and just let us know where you're coming to us from and let us know from those poll results, what are the aspects of bushfires that your career has led you down? Go ahead uh, over yep. to you, Jacqueline. Yeah, thank you, Cray, for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Jacqueline Fritzenschaff. I'm the General Manager of Research Services for Water Research Australia, a not-for-profit organization uh, which uh, has members across water utilities for drinking water and wastewater supplies um, and processing, and also regulators, consultants, and researchers. So looking at the polls, uh, my um, talk will be covering um, a lot of them in a very cursory form because that's what we're doing. We're trying to work with our members to cover the life cycle of a fire, which starts with prevention, uh, preparing it, uh, you know, responding to it, and then also recovering. So that's my take on it. Thank you for the for answering those polls. Excellent. Over to you, Patrick. Uh, yeah, I'm Patrick Glenn from the University of Melbourne, and I've been working on fire and hydrology since 2003, when the first of the mega fires hit us uh, down here in southeastern Australia. Uh, and I'll be covering uh, probably quite a few of those topics, but particularly uh, stream flow, water quality and sedimentation issues. Excellent. Awesome. Rebecca. Morning, everybody. My name is Rebecca Cramp. I'm from the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Queensland, and I'm coming to you from Yagara, Tarrable country in Brisbane. Uh, my research group has been looking at the effects of environmental change on animals, particularly aquatic fauna, for some years now. But we've relatively recently moved into looking at the impacts of fire on aquatic fauna and using our understanding of how animals respond to fire to inform and uh, help to develop management, mitigation and remediation plans. Excellent. Well, what we're looking forward to this content today, I am compiling the resources um, that we're discussing today on an accompanying website. It's called surfacewater.biz slash fire. We'll include that link in the YouTube recording in the description, and that will include references to any of the research and the publications that we'll be covering today. So if you want to take a deeper dive into these topics, have a look at that website and you'll be able to have plenty of reading material and plenty of scary things to uh, show what uh, what our planet is facing and some of the challenges that we face going forward. So Jacqueline, if you can share your screen, um, I can see that just fine. We'll turn it over to you. In the meantime, everybody in the background, keep those Q&A questions coming. Uh, a lot of times what happens is everybody waits until the very end and then we won't have time to address them. So keep the questions coming um, along the way and we'll address those in a panel format at the end. So over to you, Jacqueline. 
Well, thank you, Craig. I'm very excited today to present uh, to you and give you an overview of uh, really answering the question, how can water utilities and catchment managers be ready for water quality and yield impacts resulting from bushfires? So before I start, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country and some of you in the chat have already done so. So what are, in fact, all of us would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners, custodians and carers of the lands and waters on which we all live, work and meet. Uh, we pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Islander peoples today. And they have certainly been very involved in fire management uh, over 40,000 plus years. Uh, just a quick overview of what Water Research Australia does. Like I said, we are a not-for-profit organization. We aim to deliver a collaborative water research with our members and uh, build uh, innovation and ca uh, capability, basically supporting public health and safeguarding the sustainability of our water resources and bushfires in Australia play a big role and so what we do for our members is we get uh we gather their interests, their needs, and then we uh, publish, publish uh, research and sometimes also just simple fact sheets like the one you see there, which was produced in 2020. So um, just in terms for our international uh, audience as well, <clears throat> some statistics. Um, so in uh, 2019 uh, to 2020, we had some devastating bushfires and more than 20% of Australia's forests burned during those fires, about 13 million hectares. And that's the size of Greece or Alabama, if you wish, or Arkansas even so it's not unsubstantial and it was a combination um, of, of unusual um, combination of factors including the positive Indian Ocean dipole but also uh, the combination of vegetation uh, and being on a dry uh, country in one of the in the driest continent on on earth is is probably um, also contributing quite well to this and we'll hear more in uh, the following on uh, presentations on what that meant for certain locations so I'm going to give you a really brief overview of what we as Water Research Australia um, do when we talk to our members. And we are looking at a resilience uh, framework uh, for bushfires. And that is what we call the PPRR. So we're looking at uh, what can be done in terms of prevention. How can we prepare and plan for bushfires in the future? Uh, how do we respond? What are the aspects of response? And how can we recover? How can we build back better to be ready for the next time? And that's very relevant for Australia of course. So in the prevention space, we're looking at are our assets protected um, adequately? So that's uh, built and natural assets. Uh, can we have fit for purpose preventative measures there? For example, prescribed burning in some areas? Yes, or else uh, building our assets with different materials. The preparedness space is the one where um, we really put a lot of focus on. So uh, forecasting water quality treatment challenges for the drinking water supplies and also yield cha uh, changes from burnt catchments are quite a focus. We would like to translate that into risk assessments that can be used by our members uh, and can prepare them uh, for the future, uh, for their future responses and recovery actions. In the response scenarios, everybody runs out, uh, puts out Bias. Uh, we still want to use uh, some uh, remote surveillance techniques that could really help us with the fire spread, spotting intensity, the crown cover, uh, the, and so forth. And uh, by using those uh, new those good methods uh, will get us um, in the response space but a much better result. But also this uh, information can be used to validate any models for future incidents and, and validate them further. Also, what kind of fire retardants are we using and what impact would they have on water quality? We need to see if they are using a lot of superphosphate, which could produce um, nutrient problems later down the track. In the recovery space then, our members want to know how can we recover better? What kind of species should we use? You know, what is actually ha helping? Uh, is the landscape um, recovering naturally quite well? In what kinds of veg vegetations is that happening? And also, when we monitor the yield and water quality changes over time, again, this can be used uh, to validate our models for future recovery. And as we know, uh, there is a, a, an interplay between the yield reduction because uh, during an intense regrowth period uh, versus you know erosion and uh, vegetation destruction in the early phases creating a lot of um, yield uh, and floods uh, possibly right after the bushfire. So what does that mean for modeling? So I thought for, for this uh, talk, I'll put the role of modeling a bit in the focus. And, and really, that's the big blob in the middle. So when we model, uh, we have different um, 
uh, information on our catchments and that, that information will be used to parameterize our model. So soil slope, vegetation cover, changes in soil structure post fire is very important because it can change the porosity and the likes. But what uh, model do we then use depending on what kind of catchment data we have? Is it a one a dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional model because we have a lake or a deep river at the end of as a receptor? And so that those choices, they are quite um, important for our members to figure out, you know, and there is a, a lot out there, but the source model is the National Hydrological Platform in Australia, for example. So we try to converge on some of that. Um, importantly, we use those models to do scenario modeling. And as I said before, it uh, these models we, it will impact and influence what we can do uh, for prevention activities and also how we should respond. Um, where are the high risk areas? Where should we respond first and so forth? And then also, like I said before, the recovery actions will be uh, used to validate those models. So modeling has a really important, um, uh, plays an important role in that framework, and it is a really good decision support tool. Uh, my last slide just shows an overview of what Water RA's roadmap in that space is. So with our members, we have understood and uh, asked them for what their needs are in that space. And there in the prevention space, there was certainly <clears throat> more work to be done in the prescribed burns, you know, what kind of prescribed burns are working well for water quality, and there are different uh, intensity and in prescribed burns as well. Um, can we infuse indigenous knowledge in some of those burns? So there's talk about uh, so-called cool burns, what does that do to dissolve organic carbon in the soil and, uh, and so forth, irrespective or in addition to just the cultural value of doing those burns and engaging the indigenous community in their very old um, land management practices, which had been a very secure successful over um, a millennia, you know, so in the preparedness and planning space, um, because it's been uh, over a year and a half now since these big bushfires, we are going to pull together all the learnings from those bushfires, because a lot of the utilities in particular, and the catchment managers have undertaken a lot of work in that space and already done modeling catchment investigations and so forth. So then we hone in on the gaps and we, um, we fill in those gaps with uh, doing extra studies, but also looking at the modeling for water quality. Now modeling for water quality in bushfire is a real challenge. It's a wicked problem because on the one hand we look at sediment slugs that could be leading to oxygen depletion and fish kills that's like more instantaneous but also long-term oxygen depletion and nutrient problems. We look at ash and debris flows they are hard to model at the moment. We also look at nutrient carbon inputs over time you know can they be leaching over time as well and leading to algal blooms. Metals have been um, an interesting interesting other aspects. So sometimes um, mercury and other uh, elements are uh, going to be coming out of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the soils and the geology, depending on the heat of the fire. And also depending on what land use there was in the catchments, we're looking at pathogens and pyrolysis uh, products as well. Um, in the response space, like I said, people wanted to look at fire retardants, what are the ingredients, how can we manage those better. And um, also, very intriguingly, uh, preventing erosion. So there are different levels of erosion pre uh, prevention and uh, what uh, Australia has done a lot is, um, you know, uh, uh, constructing uh, sediment control structures in smaller and upper catchments. When should we do them? How should we design, design them? And when should we just walk away because uh, the rainfall and the ensuing flooding would just wipe them um, out? out quite quickly and it would be an investment uh, that is not very useful. Um, uh, ultimately, we're looking at the water quality uh, challenges at the water treatment plant and how we can use some treatment methodology and new treatment methods uh, to, to avert them. Um, in terms of recovery, again, build back better for recovery. We wanted to prevent, um, uh, provide a playbook uh, for bushfire recovery. And that looks at uh, do we have ecological and or this is really our roadmap uh, with our members and we are starting and have started to embark on on that roadmap and thank you uh, different modeling and different investigations and I'll hand over to Patrick. Thank you and I'm speaking from Wurundjeri land here this morning in Melbourne so uh, that's a really great intro from Jackie. Um, uh, there's a, all sorts of ways that I could 
um, talk about this. It's not so much from the mitigation side of things. It's more about, uh, this is much more about impact, but I can discuss some of that later if, if you would like. So fire and water, here we go. An interesting thing about fire in Australia and the rest of the world is that not only is there very large areas being impacted, there's also fire frequency seems to have changed very significantly in the last uh, two decades, basically. And here's just a little, um, for those of you on Australia, you might recognise Victoria, particularly the north uh, and the eastern parts of Victoria. And uh, if you're from um, elsewhere in the world, this is southeastern Australia. And this is um, a series of um, fires that have burnt once, twice, um, three times and even four times uh, within 10 or 20 years. Uh, and that's not including the Black Saturday fires. So my point here is that we're seeing um, the impact of a change of fire frequency. And although these systems, these eucalypt systems are um, highly adapted to fire, they recover uh, quite rapidly compared to many other vegetation types around the world. Um, the repeated fires can be a, a real strain on the system, if you like, and, and that's an area that we, we really haven't come to grips with all that much yet, but there's a lot of research kicking off in that area. Um, so what are the issues? I'm just going to talk a little bit about, oh, and I did mean to say also there was a, a chat entry from Fiona from Gippsland Water before who perfectly underlined that issue around fire frequency. She said she'd been working there since about 2007 and there've been multiple fire impacts since then. So sh sh there's somebody who's living with this management issue. So the issues then, there's potential issues around stream flow and water quality. Will these values be negatively impacted by fires? How much may they be? Uh, what's the time frame to recovery? Uh, things like flash flooding, where and under what circumstances, uh, and mass erosion events impacting on, on infrastructure and humans indeed. And again, where, why, and how might these link to water quality? That's uh, the kind of territory we're going to cover this morning. Um, just a really quick um, reminder to people um, about what we're talking about here. I'm presuming everybody probably understands a very um, basic water balance equation, but clearly after fire, uh, these components of the evapotranspiration in terms of transpiration and interception are the ones that are really um, impacted after a fire and can indeed be turned off for some amount of time. Um, and so there's a typical water balance for an upland southeastern Australian catchment. Um, and clearly that is going to make a difference to um, the water balance of that system. What do we know? So we know that in, um, and I must apologise uh, for the Australian ocentric um, view of this and even probably Victorian eocentric because that's where almost all of my work's been done. But we do know um, that the impact uh, on stream flow, of course, is, is highly linked to the evapotranspiration dynamics. Um, and so the response is largely about stand mortality recovery rates and, of course, the pre and post fire rainfall that I'll talk about a little bit in, in the future. And when we're thinking about this in Australia, and particularly southeastern Australia, we tend to put all of the um, sort of hundreds of eucalypt species in two boxes. One is the mixed species eucalypts, and the other one are the ash species, which tend to be dominated by two or three important species, including eucalyptus regnans, which is the world's tallest flowering plant, and only second to the uh, Californian redwoods in terms of the world's tallest trees, um, and alpine ash, um, eucalyptus delegatensis. Uh, and the reason for this is about mortality rates. And you can see uh, these, this um, photo of the mixed species <clears throat> is that there's a few dead um, trees in there, but most of them are still alive and they're recovering uh, by epicormic shoots that are triggered off by the fires. Whereas over here, you can see whole hill loads of 100% mortality in the ash species. They're killed by a moderate or, or hot fire. And how does this kind of play out in the ET stream flow realm? Well, here are some curves um, that uh, were published by um, Rachel Nolan and, and myself and some others a few years ago. Um, and this is really the important point here is this is the difference in evapotranspiration um, after fire with zero being no change. And the, the important thing here is that the 
um, the fire severity is the is the trigger here. A moderate fire severity, we think, <clears throat> um, can produce some extra evapotranspiration, which would then lead to lower stream flows, whereas uh, a high severity fire would produce the opposite, a, a little bit less evapotranspiration, and therefore um, higher stream flows. Um, and you will note that this plays out over um, less than 10 years and probably even less than five years uh, in most of these systems, we would think we would back, be back to normal. And um, <clears throat> I just had a note there to note the fire severity. I've just talked about that at length. So um, it's important to look at the time frame there that within a few years, most of these systems are going to recover quite well. These ash space species, on the other hand, um, this is the quite famous Kazera curve, at least famous in hi Australian hydrology circles. Um, and this represents a change from an, a mature or old growth um, ash stand um, that has been um, killed and then regenerates um, at a very high density. And what this shows that over a few decades, um, this model suggests that there will be um, a decline in yield as much as a 50% 50 50 decline relative to an old growth state, which I might add we have hardly any of anymore because of fire and logging. Um, and um, this peaks at about somewhere between age 25 and 30. Um, now, um, this is of great concern to um, Melbourne because most of Melbourne's water supply comes from these forests. However, I would say that recent work in our group is suggesting this may not be uh, the only, this may, but may not be the most common response in these forests. It may be one of a suite of possibilities. Uh, and that's some work where we're looking to publish quite soon. But the, the issue here is that when we look, when we go to model these, this is the first thing we do. We look at the fire severity and the species impacted. Um, and if you look at the black summer bushfires, again, we've cut the map off here at the, at the Victorian border, apologies to, that, to everybody else. Um, but if you look at this, we've got catchments here um, and the mosaic of fire severities going from um, one is uh, unburnt or, or very low impact uh, to six would be a total um, top kill. And when this plays out in um, uh, looking at portions of these, don't get too hung up on all of the um, percentages and things here. What we're looking at is two categories really. The burn severity three and four, which we would call a moderate burn, and the burn severity four and five, a hot, um, severe burn, and the difference between the ash species and the mixed species. And in the, um, this is summarized in the, uh, so the first thing to note is there was hardly any ash or very few, less than 5% of the area burnt had ash in it. So that's really not gonna have a stream flow impact. And if we look at the lower table, we've got the um, burn severity, the moderate burn severities, the high, the severe burn severities and the difference between the two. And you can see that they're, they're less than 5%. And um, from that we would, con so this, these burn severities are canceling each other out if you like. So from that we would conclude that there would probably be very little flow impact, long-term flow impact from those um, fires and indeed, um, given the um, rainfall that has occurred in those areas post fire in the, the last um, year and a half or so have been quite wet. And um, so that rainfall signal would probably dominate over this, the um, evapotranspiration signal if you like. The other thing that is really important in thinking about um, what will happen, it's not only the post fire rainfall, but also the pre fire rainfall. And of course, as people would know, uh, you usually get large fires at the end of um, serious dry periods, which means there's often high soil moisture deficits. And so the extra water from the interrupted evapotranspiration process is often just goes to fill up the bucket um, rather than going to stream flow. And early flows following black summer fires were not high um, because of this, and this, we saw the same thing in Victoria post Black Saturday, that the subsequent, uh, and in both circumstances, the subsequent wet periods that came um, are likely to dominate the flow dynamics. And here's just a, a few examples of um, post fire ET analysis um, from research from the non ash dominated catchments. And this really shows as either no change or perhaps an increase. Um, so, really, this, this, um, 
concern that will have widespread flow decreases is not um, borne out by the research. And the only uh, place where we really saw this uh, uh, a flow decrease was from small experimental catchment, which was completely um, burnt um, at a moderate severity, um, which is quite rare in um, over the larger scale. Um, there's also been some, some other analyses that haven't quite yet been published, some in our group, some from other people, um, that suggest that really we're looking at um, perhaps, you know, less than 10% generally speaking, in variability in stream flow after fire, um, which is a long way away from perhaps what we have thought in the past. And this is pretty similar to studies from around the world that have shown probably flow increases, perhaps in the order of five to 15%. Um, now a little bit on erosion and water quality. What are the potential issues? The poor water quality um, that can't be supplied. Um, uh, deterioration of stream habitat, which we'll hear a lot from Rebecca as we come, and infrastructure damage from debris flows. Okay, so the water quality impacts can range when we, this is when we, I'm really talking about um, sort of potable water, I suppose, not the in stream impact that Rebecca will talk about that. They can range from very low or, or none at all um, to off the scale. And when I say off the scale, I mean literally off the scale of measurement um, in. Um, uh, there's a lot of um, variables go into um, if we're trying to model this. Uh, the fire intensity is going to be a big, a big factor, in particular the degree of loss of ground cover and, and root strength loss, uh, which is about um, sediment availability. The post-fall rain intensity, not so much the volume, but the intensity here is really important. The degree of soil water repellency, and this is a really important um, factor in post-fire erosion, and this is what differs from, from um, traditional um, erosion modelling, for example. Soil hydraulic properties such as uh, the porosity distribution, which can be linked to forest type in, in many, some environments at least, and in particular, um, the degree of macro porosity, uh, and of course, the slope factors, which you would find in any erosion um, model. Um, although poor water quality can result from what we might call traditional erosion processes, such as real and interreal, this is usually fairly transient and you may, maybe you'll get highly turbid water for a few days, perhaps a boil water notice for some communities, but generally it will, it will um, dissipate. It's the really the mass erosion by debris flows that are a big issue for water quality um, in southeastern Australia. And why is this, why are we focused on debris flows? Um, well, the reason for this is here is um, two photos, ones of a, what you might call traditional erosion, a bit of um, sheet flow, real into real. And on the other one is a debris flow, which is stripped a, uh, a, a small stream down to bedrock. And if we look at maximum storm, storm event tonnes per hectare, we can see these are in the order of, you know, a few tonnes per hectare. This is all um, work from our research in previous years. And then we go to debris flows, which are orders of an order of magnitude or even more um, and of course, once you're connecting these up with a stream network, um, this is a pretty big deal. And so this is a, a photo of a deep debris flow um, hitting a stream network. Uh, I don't think anybody here needs to be um, uh, hit over the head by the fact this is gonna be a big problem for water quality. Um, and here is um, from one of those photos I showed before it was from the Buckland Valley uh, up in northeast Victoria in 2003. It was actually the only fatality from that large 1.5 million hectare bushfire um, where a firefighter was killed um, one evening driving along and got hit by a debris flow. Uh, and there were turbidity measurements made down the system um, in, a, in the wake of that. And you can see these have reached 140,000 NTUs. And many of you will know that five NTUs is uh, deliverable water. And that's what uh, the Avon River looked like. So that's a pretty big problem. Um, in terms of um, debris flows, like how, the question might be, well, how frequently do they happen in our systems? In Southeastern Australia, um, we mapped hundreds after the Black Saturday fires. And this, this, this is a mapping that's still underway. Um, in the wake of the Black Summer fires, and we're again finding hundreds of them. 
And here is an example, this is a fairly small area um, where these um, green dots here and the numbers uh, again, uh, next to them are um, num uh, debris flow initiation points. You can see the debris flows going down the channels. And then here is uh, these uh, pink dots down here uh, uh, where the impact happens. And that could be uh, a stream network, a reservoir, a road, bridges, et cetera, et cetera, uh, where there are very um, significant impacts. Um, there are a lot of, we understand reasonably well the risk factors in these. It has to do with a combination of fire severity, rainfall intensity, the soils, the slopes, the geology, and the rate of recovery. Um, and really, the, the, the prime places for these are steep um, country um, in drier forest types with low macro porosity um, and uh, in the first year or two after a fire is when we're really vulnerable. But you really, but the rainfall intensity, the convective thunderstorms are the big deal here. If you don't get those, you don't get these. Um, this is just something to, to illustrate, I suppose. This is runoff from um, a, a series of measured plots. Um, dry forests, which we've plot up here on an Iridi index versus wet forests. And you can see as you go from wet to dry, you get uh, peak discharge significantly impact uh, increases. Um, so it's not about the volume of rainfall, it's about the intensity and how that interacts with the, the um, environmental factors. Um, this is some work that we did, um, just been published in Water Resource Research this year, which was the culmination of about 15 years work on this, I think, where we um, came up with a, rate, a, a debris flow probability map in the Upper Yarra catchment, which is um, one of uh, Melbourne's um, main catchments and indeed connects the two, uh, connects the Thompson, um, which is the main catchment. So this is uh, something like 65% of Melbourne's water is supplied by the Upper Yarra. We modelled uh, what would happen if a high severity fire went through um, and came up with exceedance um, probabilities for, um, for this. And what you can see is that um, these are mapped debris flows in the exceedance probability, which includes the probability of the rainfall that triggered them, um, are actually pretty high. And this is fairly scary for uh, Melbourne water. Um, and with hydrodynamic modelling found that if, if even one or two or three of these kicked off, um, water would be undeliverable for over 12 months because much of the sediment, the sediment that actually hits the stream network or the reservoir are fines that don't really settle out. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about here are flash floods. I haven't really um, dwelt on this. This is something that happens quite a lot. Here's a photo from um, uh, La Cola, a small country town up in the mountains after the 2007 Great Divide fire. Um, and these are really driven by the same processes that trigger debris flows, um, which are um, small, often one or two kilometre square convective storm spells that dump um, a whole lot of rain in a small catchment area. Um, water repellency means there's very little um, infiltration and you get this kind of, um, this kind of result. Um, these don't tend to show up very much in the stream flow record if you look over um, in large water resource catchments because they're so localised. Uh, but without doubt, they are, if you happen to be in the way of one of these, that's quite a problem. Um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Rebecca, who will now put some context about what all that dirty water might mean. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Patrick, uh, thanks for that. Um, Rebecca, we'll head over, over to you in just a second. Um, wanted to just encourage everybody to keep those questions coming and have a look. There's quite a few questions on there right now. Upvote the ones that you want to see addressed because we're going to come back on with this panel and uh, hit some of these questions. Um, and if you are interested in doing what Patrick was just talking about and uh, also what Jacqueline mentioned with the modeling, we do have sediment and debris flow and um, 1D, 2D and 3D modeling courses uh, through the Australian Water School um, that you could uh, register your interest for uh, at the end. So keep that feedback coming. Over to you, Rebecca. Thanks so much, Craig. And thanks, Patrick and Jacqueline, uh, for your presentations earlier. So my focus today is really going to be at the, the impacts of post-fire water quality changes on freshwater fauna. Okay, so as we are all aware, and it's been highlighted um, countless times, Australia is a continent of fire. Many of our ecosystems have evolved 
over millennia in the presences of fire. And so many are intimately connected with fire in such that they come to depend on it for their proper functioning. However, this increasing uh, global temperatures, coupled with increasing drought frequency, is now pushing fire into places and ecosystems that have limited evolutionary experience with them. And consequently, the species in the path of these new fires are very poorly adapted to tolerate fire. The Australian Black Summer fires that we've heard about recently uh, of 2019-2020 were potentially a stark taster of fire seasons to come in Australia. Over a period of just a couple of months, more than 126,000 square kilometres of the east coast of Australia and other places uh, burnt. And this equated to, as Jacqueline said, approximately 20% of the total area of Australia covered by forest burning. And this was an unenviable global record. It's never been recorded anywhere else, this magnitude of forest being burnt. Importantly, many of these fires, the Black Summer fires, burned through bogs and temperate forests and high mountaintop plateaus, rainforests and wet forest lowlands, places just where fires should not be occurring. And as a result, more than a billion animals are thought to have perished over this period and more than billions more injured or displaced or otherwise impacted. So while the significance of fire for terrestrial ecosystems is, is apparent, it's obvious, it's easy to appreciate, for most of these ecosystems, recovery can commence almost as soon as the fire front has passed. However, freshwater ecosystems, the effects of bushfires can be equally catastrophic, but much more enduring. And until relatively recently, freshwater ecosystems have been largely left out of discussions about implications of increasing bushfire frequency for the Australian environment. Now, freshwater ecosystems are particularly precious in Australia. As one of the driest continents of, in the world, we're intimately related and connected to our freshwater ecosystems. These environments support huge numbers of fish and crayfish and amphibian species. And unfortunately, many of the, the freshwater systems that were affected by the Black Summer fires were home to some of Australia's most endangered species. And in some cases, these fires overlapped with 100% of the range of some of these critically endangered species. Tens of thousands of fish were reported as dead in the weeks following these Black Summer fires, but sadly many more were likely undocumented. Unlike the terrestrial ecosystem, impacts from bushfires can be felt tens of kilometres downstream from the fire front, and these impacts can continue to impact aquatic fauna for decades after. So I'm just going to have a bit of a, a, a brief run through about the various changes associated with uh, bushfires on water quality, and particularly as they relate to how animals will deal with these changes. So bushfire effects can be immediate, so as a result, direct result of the fire, or they can be indirect, so somewhat after the fire event has occurred. So some of the direct effects, effects can be the massive heat load that is input into freshwater systems from the fire front. And in some cases, water temperatures have been recorded at 55 degrees, which is pretty hot even for, from our perspective. Uh, the, the burning of vegetation around uh, freshwater bodies reduces riparian uh, vegetation and the shading that, these, uh, that this vegetation provides. And this can also lead to changes in, in water temperature and the amount of photosynthetically active radiation getting into water bodies. Fire can directly deposit ash and debris through wind and, and, um, and just the movement of ash into the water systems. And that can uh, add a huge load of nutrients into these water systems. Um, that can also lead to the smothering of aquatic vegetation and substrate, which can remove food availability from animals. And as Patrick spoke about, the fires can increase soil erodibility and hydrophobicity. So with post-fire rainfall events, we get a lot of indirect post-fire effects on water quality. So as Patrick discussed with, uh, earlier, ash and sediment and debris runs off into freshwater systems. And this, uh, when these uh, happen acutely, they can cause hypoxic events where microbial activity rapidly strips the oxygen from these water systems. Uh, heavy metals and carcinogens can be mobilized from the ash and burnt rocks. The ash is quite uh, alkaline, so ash deposition into water systems can increase water pH. As I mentioned before, the loss of riparian vegetation can change shading uh, of these water bodies, which can cause long-term changes in water temperature. Uh, as Patrick also mentioned, the turbidity 
that can persist post fire can be significant and have significant implications for animals. And as he also mentioned, there can be altered water flow patterns through these freshwater systems, which can persist for uh, years even. So how aquatic species cope with the changes to water quality impacts following wildfires largely stems from their ability or not to physiologically tolerate and adjust to the changes in their environments. So all organisms operate within a relatively narrow range of water quality tolerances. Fluctuations outside of these ranges can cause uh, lethal effects or can impair physiological functioning, which in turn can reduce their ability to feed or reproduce. For freshwater animals, environmental temperature and oxygen levels are critical determinants of their performance capacity and abrupt changes or substantial changes in temperature or dissolved oxygen associated directly with wildfires or in the subsequent post-fire runoff changes and shading changes can outright kill animals or impair their performance, leading to increased predation risk and disease and reduced recruitment. Likewise, acute inputs of ash and burnt and unburnt organic matter can destratify water bodies and promote rapid microbial activity that strips water of oxygen, in some cases reducing oxygen by 98% for extended periods of time. The suspended ash and sediment that washes into freshwater systems can, uh, can clog the gills and um, breathing structures of animals, meaning that they can no longer take up oxygen from an already oxygen depleted environment. And heavy metals and carcinogen, carcinogens that leak from sediments and ash can be toxic or can be sublethal and impair their physiological performance. And as I mentioned earlier, the nutrient loads from ash and organic matter entering these water systems can cause sustained eutrophication, which can also compromise water oxygen levels. So managing the impacts of bushfire on freshwater ecosystems is a real priority now. And the response of Australia's most at-risk fauna to fire-associated water quality changes are really unknown. And that's really the point of the research that my group is doing now. Fires are pushing into these areas where fires haven't occurred before. And we have no idea how the animals are going to contend with some of these water quality changes and how we might be able to mitigate and manage some of those impacts to preserve uh, the ranges of these critically endangered animals. So our group is using physiological performance metrics as important indicators of the impacts of fire on uh, water quality. Uh, animals respond directly to changes in water quality in their environment, and we can detect those changes through measurements of their physiological techniques, uh, sorry, physiological systems. And these kind of metrics will allow us to develop allowable limits for water quality changes. How hot can the water get before we need to go in and deal with something? Or how much is too, is too little oxygen for some fish? These management, uh, these allowable limits can then be triggers for management in interventions. At what point do we have to go in there and rescue populations? And they can also guide recovery trajectories. At what point can we go back and put fish that we've rescued back into these affected uh, environments? Uh, and they are also important for informing species management guidance uh, guidelines post and pre-fire and informing these emergency management actions. So I just wanted to give you a quick run through of a case study about some of the work that we've been doing to in, in this space. Uh, recently, our group has moved into looking at the effects of bushfire associated water quality changes on aquatic animals with the main purpose of identifying some of these threshold limits for temperature and oxygen disturbance, and then being able to use these as some guidelines to inform how we might manage uh, the potential impacts of fire and recovery in uh, areas where these species occur. So we exposed four species of fish, four crustacean species and three frog species to bushfire ash and fine sediments for a period of a couple of weeks to a couple of months and we had a look at the physiological responses. Now the fish and crayfish that species that we chose were a mixture of species that were either direct surrogates for species likely to be affected in southern Australia in some of these really um, highly vulnerable and uh, environments that are fairly new to fire. Um, and some of the species were also more widely distributed. So that gives us an idea of whether the species in these novel fire fronts effectively are more or less tolerant than species that are, are broadly distributed. 
So our research found that for the amphibian species that we tested, there were very few impacts of the prolonged exposure to bushfire ash and sediments on these animals directly. Uh, indeed, there was a slight positive benefit to some of the amphibian larvae because the input of ash and sediment resulted in a, a, a slight degree of eutrophication. This meant there was more food available to these animals. Fish and crustaceans, on the other hand, responded quite differently. So the species that came from these more uh, sensitive high altitude or temperate climates, they already had lower thermal and oxygen tolerance limits than species that were more broadly distributed. However, when we exposed them to chronic ash and sediment for a period of time, their temperature and oxygen tolerance limits were further reduced, meaning they're even more sensitive to temperature and oxygen changes following, gill, uh, following um, ash and sediment exposure. And they also suffered gill damage. And we're not sure how long this will last for, but this means that their ability to take up oxygen from the environment and perform all of their aerobic activities is likely compromised. So our research uh, showed that the water quality changes, some of the water quality changes uh, that fish or crayfish may be experiencing following a fire can differentially affect species. And this needs to be taken into consideration because potentially you end up with changes in community composition where more tolerant species tend to dominate in areas where fires have gone through. Species and populations from cooler climates appear to be at a greater risk relative to lowland species. And this means that we need to really prioritize their management because they're at a much greater risk. We found that chronic ash and sediment exposure impairs oxygen and temperature tolerances further. And this is an important abiotic interaction that needs to be considered when we are developing these management intervention threshold triggers. But you know, some of the upsides can be that low level fires, particularly um, outside of breeding seasons of animals can actually provide some benefits to some species. And that also needs to be taken into consideration. So that's a quick summary and snapshot of the work that our group is uh, doing at the moment. Um, I'm happy to take some questions later with the rest of the panelists, if you have any. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Rebecca. There are quite a few questions that have come in. Um, I see that uh, the panelists have been frantically typing responses to those questions. What we'll do here is um, just kind of turn it over to uh, everyone back in the same order we went in. Um, that way it gives you a chance, uh, Rebecca, to have a look at the ones that have just rolled in um, recently while you were talking. Um, and so let's start with uh, with Jacqueline. If you could go through and maybe uh, pick pick a question or two that, um, that you've addressed or that um, uh, pertains to your, uh, your topic that you presented Presented, and um, then we'll 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 keep going uh, cycling through the panelists and do keep these questions coming in the background and upvote those. We have about ten minutes to go here, so um, we, we should have have time for a couple of uh, a couple of these to get addressed. Uh, Jacqueline, over to you. Uh, well, I'll start with one where I didn't have the opportunity to put my answer in because it didn't it didn't work. So it, it was the water tanks, uh, you know, on the big hill and what uh, what one would do, uh, how how one should construct them, or uh, what if there's any advice. And I think the question is, um, is that water tank already there and the bushfire uh, comes along? Uh, you know, what do we do then, or do we design a water tank so it's bushfire re resilient? You know, so there are two different questions. So I'm not exactly sure what the question was, but uh, in a nutshell, uh, the um, you know obviously if a bushfire comes through there are some processes you can undertake to to clean that water for you if you're using it for stock or drinking um you know uh, uh, kind of um boil it uh, sometimes the ash is not as um important to to get rid of but it depends and if there are metals in there so chlorinate it boil it uh and let it settle so that type of thing if um and also you know in the design uh space uh, there's new materials that people are putting up obviously plastic tanks not recommended but all, you know more like steel tanks and and the like so maybe concrete tanks and uh, cover them up so i'm not sure if i answer that there are some um advice sheets around and i'll try to dig them up but yeah mm. thank you um, so I'll, I'll leave yeah. it at that I, th I think i answered a few in the chat so i'm not on the q a so maybe we'll just leave them for now and give yeah, others and a chance uh, Patrick, over to you. A couple of things I saw you addressing earlier. Um, which ones would you like to highlight? Um, well, there's this one from, <clears throat> excuse me, from Marianne Milton, who um, wanted to know about um, groundwater impacts uh, and whether or not there's a change in um, base flow or stream um, discharge. Um, not, I couldn't say that I've done any work or no, even know of any work on on groundwater. Um, responses to fires, 
Um, mainly because, you know, mostly these happen in upland forested areas where there aren't any groundwater bores. Um, but um, we do know that, as I said, that the, um, uh, you know, there's often large soil water deficits which are um, filled after the fire. Uh, and I have done some work on uh, base flow, um, et cetera. And um, there does, it seems to be, um, we get a fairly regular, um, if there are flow increases, they tend to be um, pretty much across the flow regime. So not, there's probably an increase in base flow, but also in total flow. Um, that was that one. There was another one there on um, fuel reduction burns. Um, which was for Rebecca, I think. Oh, I missed that one. Can you read it out to me? Because I can't see it. I can read it out. It's from Fiona Feel. Uh, is there any research on the impacts of fuel reduction burns where they are carried out very regularly on aquatic freshwater species, i.e. to compare cooler burns with severe bushfire impacts? I'm not, um, I'm not aware of any, but our research kind of hinted that there may actually be beneficial impacts of fuel reduction burns for aquatic ecosystems, particularly those where, you know, some of the nutrient inputs may be beneficial to animals living in the water, like the amphibian species. So pretty much herbivorous species, I would imagine, would tolerate um, and maybe benefit from some of those fuel reduction burns, as opposed to the large, uh, significant wildfire type burns, which is kind of dumping a whole pile of crap in there. And pretty much things are being killed before they get a chance to benefit from any of those post fire water quality changes. I mean, we have done a little bit of work on, um, on this issue of, you know, does planned fire cause erosion? <clears throat> and in general, not too much. Um, but of course, um, you know, burning, uh, control burning is more of an art than a science really. And so, you know, if, if, it's, if it's kept to a cool burn, then there's probably, you're probably a little bit unlucky if you get a water quality impact. Uh, but I think, but of course fires, you know, their, their intensity can vary spatially quite easily. So where you get, where it gets a bit hotter, then, you know, there can be some issues, but overall it's, it's, fairly low risk, we think. Great. Um, and uh, I guess we'll just open it up now. We've just got a few minutes to go. Um, Jacqueline, back to you. Anything that you've seen uh, come up that you wanted to highlight? I think um, <clears throat> Jackie Bellhouse's uh, question was really um, intriguing. Uh, some on the modeling, you know, the non-stationarity -sta aspect, and also um, mm. that a lot of the model and others have said, uh, you know, that a lot of the models are not actually including um, these bushfire type um, modules because they're calibrated on normal rainfall runoff conditions. And, and I think that is the challenge that some of us are trying to embrace and get those modules going. Patrick, <laughs> you, you, you're eager to talk. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was distracted by looking at the Q and A's. <clears throat> what was oh. that? What was that? Oh, oh anyways, uh, so yeah, so I think uh, Patrick, you answered that question on the non-stationarity. I think there are oh, okay, some yes. models that are trying to do uh, to do that. Um, also, yep. Water um, Research Australia also has a Resili Wiki for its members, which is like a one-stop shop uh, for all the climate data and all uh, those catchment type aspects, from catchment to drinking water tap and and beyond. And uh, that is um, in in the process of hopefully being maintained in in the future because those things change. And you know? so, what are we using? How are we going about it? And there's certainly room for that aspect to be um, more refined. I think that would be a really great, um, you know, research project in my view. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, all these aspects. Um, you can see that this is a big conglomeration of disciplines, and it takes a lot of interdisciplinary coordination to really figure out what's going on here. Um, a lot of what we've done through the Australian Water School over the last uh, two or three years has been focused on modeling. Um, and it's something that we want to explore for next year. Um, should we be getting more into, uh, you know, environmental topics, some of the water quality topics, uh, do give us your feedback on that. Um, and for those who have come on board to this presentation today from the modeling background, I hope you got something out of this as well. Um, these, as, as our presenters have mentioned, you know, it, it, is, it is difficult to do. And sometimes uh, when you're just looking at picking a coefficient um, out of a textbook um, and saying, I'm gonna apply this uh, runoff coefficient or this curve number or whatever it is, um, uh, this parameter that you're going to pop into your model, 
um, at least consider what would happen you know, if the catchment uh, burned out, uh, because you want to, even if you haven't been asked to consider that, um, it may be worth highlighting and putting it into your model to show that, you know, you could get astronomically higher flows, you know, flows that approach a probable maximum flood when you start getting some of this debris forming and then potentially breaching. Um, we've got uh, all, all sorts of tools to be able to simulate that, but the model has to know to try it and to plug it in and to uh, see what would happen. Um, as we've mentioned, as everybody has said here today, um, climate change is likely to increase this, the severity of these events, some of the droughts in some of these areas um, and the other impacts are going to have a substantial impact on how often this happens and how whether it ought to be considered uh, in your planning going forward. So with that, um, just a minute or two to go. So I'll just let everybody have their closing remarks and then we'll sign off for the day. So back in order again, uh, we'll sign off this way. Um, Jacqueline, if you just want to you know, have any closing remarks, then over to Patrick, then to Rebecca to close it out. Now, I, I thank you so much for your questions. I think it gives everybody uh, um, a room to think about what to do next. So I'll, I'm sure you'll be answering that in the survey as well. <laughs> thank you very much. Excellent. Over to Patrick. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening and uh, your interest. And uh, it's, a, it's a topic that um, has got a lot of legs, as we would say in Australia, that there's a lot to still understand, particularly with this connection between climate change and repeated fires, I think. And as Rebecca showed, these areas that are not usually burnt. Thank yeah, you. Exactly. Uh, Rebecca, over to you to close it out. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming along today and for the invitation from the Australian Water School. It was really great to be able to present some of the research, which is really new for our group. So um, this is a new space for us uh, and we're really interested in continuing our work in this area. Thank you. And this all comes about um, uh, Jana Dielenberg over at uh, University of Queensland, um, who I I'd met um, well at uh, Melbourne Water uh, about a decade ago. Um, came on the radio talking about endangered species and some of the impacts from bushfires. And I thought, hey, let's check this out. So thanks to Yana for lining up uh, some of our speakers today. Thanks to you for attending. You'll see the link here to the survey. Do fill that out. Let us know what you want to see coming forward. And um, everyone will have a uh, the opportunity to tune back in on the recording if there's anything that you missed. Uh, have a look at the courses that are coming up here. Uh, we're excited to bring you this content and steer it uh, more in the direction that will be most relevant to your uh, careers going forward. So thanks for that. We'll sign off and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water visit the australianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.